Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me to the book of Genesis, the 45th chapter, and watch this video clip as they play it, please. We stand at the edge of this new year. These 365 days in front of us. And instead of letting them blow by us, we look each of them in the eye. And one by one. We live them with intention. 365 days of sheer purpose. Each lived like it's the only day we've got. What if I live every day like no other day is owed to me? I'd reach out to my dad, make things right before it's too late. On my sister's birthday this year, I'd call instead of text. I would wake up in the morning and I would ask God what he wants me to do. I'd take those vacation days I still haven't used. Instead of inviting her to coffee, I'd invite her to church. Make myself get up early so I can watch cartoons with my kids. I'd give myself a break. I would take her to that park she's been wanting to go to, the one that's all the way across town. I'd say I love you, and I'd say it every day. On Thanksgiving, my table would be open to the whole neighborhood. Mother's Day would mean more than a $5 card. I'd let God have all the stuff weighing me down. I'd have more courage, because I'd have nothing to lose. I would take Jesus seriously when he asked us to feed the hungry. Serve the very least of these. Look after the sick. I'd be quicker to forgive because he forgave me. Living every moment with intention. Taking every purpose by the horns. Leaving nothing unsaid. Leaving nobody behind. Making every minute count. I would use every hour I had on this earth. To love God. To love others. One intentional day at a time. Amen. We stand at the beginning of a new year, but isn't it amazing how quickly last year passed by? And so it's choosing to live a life with purpose, being intentional with what we do and not allowing time to slip through our hands. You know, I've noticed something. I'm not 30 years old anymore. It's hard for me to believe that. I've got children that are actually older than I am now. You know, I, I mean, it, in your mind, you, you attain an age and you feel like that you're there and everybody else around you is aging and growing old and you can't figure out why that's happening to them. And it's not touching you. And so you look in the mirror. And then I realize, well, I, I guess it has touched me. And I, I realize that I'm, I've only got a certain amount of time on this earth and I want to make it count. And so I have to live life with purpose, live life intentionally, and make sure that I don't let it slip through my hands. So I want to speak to you today on a, this topic, a place prepared for you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this new year and for your love, for the opportunity that you've given us, God, to be here Thank you for life. Thank you for the opportunity to live it for you. And we pray today that you'll help us to live it for you to the utmost. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Israel has a long, rich history. Israel started with one man named Abraham. God chose him out from among a world of people, and he said, I'm going to do something special in your life he said I'm going to multiply you and make you like the sand of the sea Abraham 75 years old and still nothing's happened he's waiting around 80 God you know I mean hey how many of you've ever felt like God kind of forgot you know what I mean like all of a sudden that time just keeps slipping by and you're thinking well what the Lord spoke to me hasn't happened yet and so now I'm wondering if it's ever going to happen and and Abraham doesn't have the son of promise until he's a hundred years old a hundred years old and then the promise that he heard God speak to him wouldn't even come to pass in his lifetime Can I tell you that this is about more than us? See, sometimes we live our life like it's just about me. 
just about just, but Abraham lived his life on purpose according to something that he had heard that had, was prepared for him and when he had Isaac he does not give up and say man I'm a hundred years old now now it's too late for God to do anything can I tell you that when they put me in the ground, God's still going to be doing stuff? I'm going to be in his presence, and God's still going to be doing work here. Amen. So that means I probably ought to focus on investing my life in more than just me. I need to spend some time making sure that my family has the right foundation. I need to make sure that my grandchildren know about him. I need to let everybody around me know about my love for God and his love for us. Time marches on and a famine hits. Jacob is born. He has 12 sons, and a famine hits the land. And now he feels like, well, what am I going to do? There's, there's no produce, and, we're, we're, you know, things are getting tight, and things are getting bad, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Now, look at Genesis 45, because Jacob receives a promise. Listen to these words. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, Thou and thy children and thy children and thy children's children and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast, and there I will nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. When you read that, that promise almost sounds like the words of Jesus, right? that I'm going to bring you to me, that I'm going to provide for you, that I'm going to care for you, that I'm going to watch over you. But in fact, those are the words of Joseph. Those are the words of a son that he thought dead. Those are the words of a son that they brought his coat to him covered in blood and, 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 and said, is this Joseph's coat? And, and Jacob had given him up and had, had, had broken heart and it felt like uh, he, it's, it's over for Joseph. And how many times have we ever felt like it's over and we've given up and we've abandoned ship and here he is uh, sending a word to his father, I'm alive and well and I'm going to take care of you. <laughs> Oh, it's not unlike what Jesus said to us in John 14 when he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. Do you understand that when I close my eyes here, I'm going to be more alive than I've ever been in my life? That a new life is going to dawn on me. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I am not saved by my works, but I am rewarded according to my works. The Scripture talks about that every man's work is going to be tried to find out whether it's gold and silver or whether it's hay and stubble. Did you ever have somebody do a job for you and you found out they weren't half the carpenter you thought they were? <laughs> Or worse yet, did you ever do a job for yourself and find out you weren't half the carpenter you thought you were? <laughs> I hate it, man, when all, all of a sudden, you know, you, t you tell your wife, no, don't worry about that plumbing. I'll take care of that. I can handle that. I ain't going to pay no guy to come in here and spend all that money and ca crawl down there and spend hours underneath the house and sometimes days underneath the house and crawl out and say, well, baby, call the plumber. <laughs> See, we need to make sure that what we're doing, we're doing because God wants us doing it. I mean, I could get up here today and I could sing you a special, and none of you would think it was special at all. And what I'm doing isn't going to bless you because I'm not doing what God asked me to do. See, life is filled with plans and purpose with God. Now, here's a famine going on, but God prepared a place for Jacob. And Joseph discovered something. Joseph discovered that just because you're mistreated 
And just because you get shoved and pushed around doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. Just because you feel like you, you, you're the last on the list and, and, and nobody wants you around and everybody's trying to push you back, uh, he found out that when God is for you, no one can be against you. That man went from a prison to a palace in a matter of moments uh, because he held on to God. Everybody say, just hold on. God's got a place prepared. Now, watch this. Joseph's life is a reminder that not only does God not forget us, he doesn't forget our family. Joseph is not forgotten by God. And Joseph winds up sitting as the second most powerful man in the known world. He controls Egypt. Only Pharaoh seated on the throne is higher than he is. But Pharaoh has relinquished the operation of the kingdom to him. This is a boy of obscurity. This is a boy that his brothers disdained. This is a boy that no one thought would matter. But he had his dreams. Don't give up on your dreams, especially when those dreams have come from God. You may end up sidetracked at times, you may feel like I've lost my way at times, but God does not forget. He says that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. What's that mean? I've heard people talk about what well, that means. Well, you can't repent over what God called you to do. That's not what that said. What it's saying is that once God puts something in your life, he doesn't change his mind. He doesn't, he doesn't repent from that. It's there. And so you have to step into it. Somebody say, take a step forward. God prepares a place for us even during difficult t times and trying times. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1 says, To everything there is a season and a time and a purpose under heaven. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Our lives are lived in seasons. How many of you remember the first season of your life when you were a baby in diapers mom would come and change you you remember how you always appreciated that I, I don't remember anything about that that was a season that I was oblivious to and I had to trust God to see me through that season you know, if I could trust God when I don't know nothing, it only stands to reason I ought to be able to trust him when I know something. You remember the seasons of your life in grade school? How many of you can remember when you were in grade school? You remember that season? That season changed, didn't it? And all of a sudden, you keep looking and seasons keep changing, and you think, whoa, I need to whoa down, slow down on some of these changes. But the truth is, is this. is that while seasons change, God doesn't. The Scripture said that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you may have entered a time in your life where things have become difficult. You may have entered a season that's challenging, but God's promise and his purpose for you has not changed. And no matter what it seems like around you, God stands ready to get you through it to, to get so you can get to it. Amen. <laughs> Turn around, look at your neighbor, and say, I got to get through it so I can get to it. Time passes. Israel is living in the land of Goshen, prospering there, multiplying there, and the season changes, and all of a sudden now they're serving the slaves in the same land where they had prospered. If you, any of you ever can relate to that, you know what I mean? It's like all of, you got a great job, and then one day you go in and you find out you're laid off. Everything seems to be going right. You go in for a checkup, and all of a sudden the doctor calls and says, we need you to come back in. You think 
that you've got everything set up and you're just, man you got the home that you've been waiting for and you're getting ready to purchase it and all of a sudden the interest rate goes up and it throws off your ability to borrow and it changes everything everything that's around us is subject to change but God's promises are not he said that the promises of God are yes and amen in other words God is saying what I promised you I'm going to bring to pass but there's something that I need you to do I'm going to keep my promise to you but I need you to keep your focus on me Let's try it one more time. I'm going to keep my promise to you, but I need you to keep your focus to me. That's what God is telling us. That's what he's saying to us. They, look, they're in Israel, right? Slavery's hit, and it feels like, man, what's, you know, what is going on? God's forgotten me. Everything has gone haywire, and, and this season lasts for a while. But God had not forgotten, and God's plan had not shifted. In Exodus 3 and 19, the Lord speaks to Moses, and he says, Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. Now hear me. God had not forgotten them, but there was a time that was building up, and then God was going to act. How many of you remember your parents? Wave your hand at me if you remember. I hope you do. No, no, no. Here, I, I want I want to ask you a question. See, my dad, you, you've heard me talk about you know my brothers, and so my my brother Paul, you know, always talking. Paul's gone on to be with the Lord now, but Paul always used to say he was abused, and my older brother said, Paul, you weren't abused. You were just stupid. And this is why, because my dad would tell Paul something, he'd correct him, and Paul would start talking back to my dad. And I, I, I watch this, man. I watch this going on, and I watch my oldest brother looking at him, Paul, shut your mouth, man. Paul, shut your Dad's getting mad. Shut your mouth, Paul. Shut your mouth. And Paul could not help himself. Paul just kept on until all of a sudden the fullness of time had come. <laughs> <laughs> and dad got a belt out <laughs> and went to work on Paul. Now, watch. Egypt has a fullness of time that's coming. And then all of a sudden, when it came, God said, I've heard the cry of my people. It's not that he hadn't heard the cry. It's that now the fullness has come, and God is getting ready to render judgment on Egypt. Everybody say, judgment coming to Egypt and that judgment was going to happen while the children of Israel was still in that present country that judgment was going to take place while they were there but God is true to his word I have a place prepared for you watch this all of a sudden all of a sudden, judgment starts taking place, and, 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 and all these judgments are coming down on Egypt. Look in Exodus chapter 8, verse 22. The Lord speaks to Israel, and in that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. In order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land, I will make it a difference between my people and your people tomorrow this sign shall be this is Moses talking to Pharaoh he's saying God's getting ready to separate some things he said judgments coming on Egypt but he's going to protect his people in the midst of it now now watch what he does here look at uh, Exodus I'm sorry Exodus 9 and 26 only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. 
I want you to hear me that it doesn't matter what's going on around you. Judgment is falling on the nation of Egypt, and yet God takes his people, and even while it's falling around them, it's not falling on them. Oh, somebody ought to get excited about this. Even while it's falling around them, it's not falling on them. He said, I'm going to cause a separation so people are going to be able to see that there's a difference between God's people and Egypt. I'm going to show you that those who keep their focus on me have a place prepared for them, but those that forget me end up being sucked up in everything going on around them. How many of you know that's true? Just ask yourself this question in your own life. The times you got your focus off God, where did it lead you? If, you, if your focus has always been on God, and bless your heart, man, and thank God for it. Honestly, I'm being serious about that. Thank God for it. I know what happens if you get your focus off of God. I've been there. And I'm telling you, the only thing that ever brought my life back together again was when I quit looking and focusing on everything around me and I started focusing on the one that saved me, on the one that gave his life for me, on the one that changed me. And when I began to focus on him, it changed everything around me. God keeps his promise to us, but he expects us to keep our focus on him. In Exodus 19, this is two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrive in the wilderness of Sinai, and Moses climbs to the mountain and appears before God, and the Lord called him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you'll be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on the earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. God brings them out, and he says, now I want you to consider something. I, you, you need to take a look around you and understand what just happened. The strongest nation in the world had an iron fist on you, and they would not move it. They would not lift it. But I carried you out of here on eagle's wings. When he brought them out, not only did he bring them out, but he brought them out prosperous. They had, they, they went and bought, borrowed gold and silver from the Egyptians and they were, can you imagine going to your neighbor and saying, hey, I, could, could I borrow some money? And they empty their bank account out to you. Oh, here, take it, take it. I mean, that didn't even make sense, did it? But you need to understand that God delights to do the impossible. And no matter how hard it seems, no matter how difficult the circumstance may be, appear to you, God is able to change it in a moment. Turn around and look at your neighbor and say, in a moment. Have any of you ever experienced that before? Have you ever experienced God changing it for you just like that in a moment? I mean, have you ever? Have, I, I remember I was, uh, I, I was 19 years old, not married. I'd moved to Missouri, and I, I had an account at a gas station where I could charge. Thing about charging stuff, you got to pay for it. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, that, that time a month rolled around and I had to pay, I had a gas bill for, I don't, I don't remember what it was, maybe $75 or something, you know, from filling gas up. And I thought, man, what am I going to do? I, I don't have the money for this. And, and, and he, he, the guy asked me, he said, you know, your, your bill's coming up due. He said, yeah. I said, yeah, I'll pay it Saturday. I had no clue how I was going to pay it Saturday. I just told him I'm going to pay it Saturday. Saturday rolled around and, and I thought, man, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I thought, I'm going to call mom. <laughs> Every mother say, yes. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to call mom. You know, I'm going to call mom, and, and she's and she going to bail me out. And I thought, no, I'm not going to call mom. I'm going to trust Jesus. 
This, look, this was, this was a time in my life where all of a sudden God was trying to find out if I would learn how to keep my focus on him. And man, and, and I said, I'm not calling mom. I'm, I'm going to trust God. I, I'm just going to trust Jesus with this. And time just kept ticking, and I'm wanting to turn the clock back, and I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do. I told that guy I was going to pay him on Saturday. I don't know what I'm going to do. And man, time is ticking away. And all of a sudden, Debbie's mom comes to over to where I, I'm, I'm at, and she said, hey, I saw uh, your old landlord in town. I said, yeah. She said, yeah. She, she told me that you moved out before you used up all your rent. And here's some money. I ain't never heard of a landlord giving you money back from rent. <laughs> and you know what happened? I had an, I ran down to that gas station. I paid that bill with a smile on my face and said, fill her up. Not only did I have enough, not only did I have enough to pay what I owed, I had enough to keep me going. Now, somebody hear what I'm saying. Now, if you'll keep your focus on God, God will keep you going. He has a place prepared for us. If we keep him at the center of our heart, he will keep us through storms, through troubles, and even judgments. And we'll find the place he's prepared for us. But we have to make sure that we're focused on him. Here's a danger we have. We run the danger of trying to do it our own way. Any of you, I want you to raise your hands on this. I'm not going to let you get away with it. And the reason you're going to have to raise your hand is because my hand is going to have to go up on this. How many of you guys, or, or girls, either one, have ever bought something from the store, whether it was a, a bookshelf or a stereo system or whatever, that required assembly and you didn't look at the directions. You said, I don't need it. I'll just put it together. Oh, thank God. Turn around and look at all these hands around here. Look at all these hands around here. I know some of you going, well, yeah, I, I've done that, but I didn't need the directions. Well, hooray for you. <laughs> I went, man, I was putting this cabinet together. I was so proud. I got this cabinet. This is back when there were VCRs. Those of you that aren't old enough to understand that, you can talk to somebody that's got some gray hair. VC, remember those? Those VCR tapes had a cabinet that would hold all those. I was so proud. That was such a beautiful cabinet. And I got that cabinet. All, and I thought, why won't it shut? And I, and I realized that I had turned the door upside down on the thing. And I thought, oh, man. Now, here's the deal. Well, what's all that got to do with what you're talking about, Pastor? I'm telling you that if we don't learn how to follow God's instructions, it's going to take us a lot longer to get us to where he wants us. They spent 40 years wandering in that wilderness, and it was an 11-day journey. Boy, you talk about taking the long way around turning 11 year, or eleven days into 40 years? Why? Why did that happen? It's obvious that they didn't keep their focus on God. They kept focusing on things around them and on things behind them. Several of them kept saying, I, I, you know, we, we just need to go back where we started. Go back where we came from, and that wasn't going to change anything. Hear me. Don't give up on what God's getting ready to do in your life simply because you don't understand how he's going to do it. Amen. You have to hold on. Everybody say, trust him. Now, listen, when we keep our focus, listen to what he promises. He says, for I know the thoughts that I have, to, or that I think towards you, says the Lord. This is Jeremiah 29. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me. When? When you search for me with all your heart. What's he saying? He's saying, when I become the focus of your world then everything is going to begin to come together for you. 
and your promise won't be delayed any longer. Somebody say it with me. My promise no longer delayed. I want to share a story with you, a true story about a four-year-old boy. The way I came across the story is Debbie was praying uh, yesterday, and as she finished praying, she came into me and she said, man, she said, the Lord spoke this name in my spirit. She said, I, I heard this name, and I said, I, I didn't recognize the name. And, and so she Googled the name, and we discovered the story of a four-year-old boy. The four-year-old boy, when he was born, was not breathing. His body had turned purple, and they announced him stillborn. But his mama and father began to pray, and as they began to pray, life came back in to that child. And he went home with them. Life went on. Everybody say, life lived in seasons. When he turned four years old, he found himself in Germany. They were living, the family was living in Germany, and at four years old, the little fella got too close to a window, and he fell out of a window four stories up and hit the ground. Doctors were immediately there because they lived right across from the hospital. The doctors came across. They got down and started examining the little boy, and they covered him with a sheet. They said, man, he's dead. And all of a sudden, his mother said, no. And, and, and she picked that boy up, and she said, Jesus, Jesus, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. And all of a sudden, she screamed from the top of her voice, and she said, the blood of Jesus. And all of a sudden, that little fella started to move in her arms, and they, they took him over to the hospital, and he made a full recovery. But now hear me, while he's at the hospital, and he's in recovery, his mother comes into the room. And when his mother came in to the room, he, when he got to the, where he could talk to her, he said, Mom. He said, and she said, do you remember? He said, Mom, I remember falling from the window. He, she, she said, or he said, but I never hit the ground. And, and he, she said, what do you mean you never hit the ground? I, I saw, said, no, Mom, I fell from the window. He said, but before I ever hit the ground, this guy that had big hands caught me. And he said, when he caught me, he said, I looked up to see who he was, and he said it was so bright I couldn't, I couldn't see his face. And he caught me, and I heard him say, do you want to go with me, or do you want to go to be with your mama? And he said, man, I'm four years old. He said, I, I want to go. I, I want to go and be with my mama. And he said, okay. He said, I'll let you go be with your mama this time, but next time you're going to come and be with me. And as, all of a sudden, as he started to let him down, he said, he looked up and he said, Sir, he said, what's your name? And the man replied, Son, my name is Jesus. I want you to understand that in a time of trouble, uh, he's Jesus. Uh, that no matter where you're at in your life, you say, but what happens if he, uh, listen, I want you to hear what the boy said, that, or what the, Jesus told the little boy. Do you want to go with your mom, or do you want to come and be with me? He said, I, I want to go with my mind. It wasn't a losing proposition any way you looked at it. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? He either went to be with his mama or he went to be with Jesus. Uh, you need to hear what I'm saying. Just because you have a setback uh, doesn't mean you've been set down. Uh, just because you have trouble uh, doesn't mean it's over. Just because that the Egyptians uh, are breathing down your neck uh, doesn't mean they can keep you from the promise of God. Uh, it's time to stand up uh, and shout, God, I I'm going to claim my promise. Would you stand with me today? We are in the first day in the first month of a brand new year. And we need to make some proclamations and declarations that my family belongs to God. No matter what's happening, around me, 
My family belongs to God and he has a place prepared for us. He has a place prepared for us. When my mama was passing, I asked God to restore life to her. He answered the prayer, but not the way I wanted it answered. Because mama went on to be with the Lord. But this is what I saw. She'd been in a coma for several days on life support. When they, when the time came and the doctor said, there's nothing else we can do for her, we need to unhook her. We had the option of whether we would go or stay. I wanted to stay in the room. When they unhooked her, all of a sudden her eyes opened for the first time in days. And I was calling to her. I said, Mom, can you hear me, Mom? And her eyes opened up and they were all milky. And she closed her eyes and I said, Mom, I said, it's okay. I said, Jesus is coming for you, Mom. I said, it's all right. Do you want to go with me or do you want to stay here? I want to stay here until my work here is done. And when my work here is done, ain't no grave going to hold this body down. <laughs> I said, when my work here is done, I, and so I'm, I'm talking to her and I'm saying, Mama, it's all right. He's coming. Walk toward him, Mama. Walk toward him. And she opened her eyes back up and her eyes were clear and clear, crystal. I mean, it looked like I was looking into the eyes of a young lady and they were bright and brilliant. And all of a sudden she closed her eyes and when she opened them again, she opened him in his presence. You need to hear me today. He has a place prepared for us. Don't get your focus off of him. The devil will try and get you to focus on everything around you so you're not focusing on him. He'll get you to focus on your heartbreak and your heartache, on your disappointment on your misconceptions, on family around you, anything to just get your eyes off of him. Because the devil understands that there's not enough demons in hell to stop God from doing what he's promised to do in your life when we're focused on him. Everybody say focus. Distractions can cost you. Do you ever think about how many car accidents happen? A lot of people aren't even texting. They're just looking down at a text for a second. And then all of a sudden it's over. A distraction. They reach down to change the radio station. Just a moment. And it cost them. French fry falls in your lap. And when you go to pick it up, you lose your focus for just a second on where you're going. And it can cost you. People talk about me here at this church. They say, man, I think that some folks thought I was the most stuck up guy they'd ever met. They said, I was driving. I, I passed you in town. I said, I, I was waving at you. And you never responded. You, you never looked at me. You never. Then he said, I, I, I pulled up right. I started honking my horn at you and said, you wouldn't even look my way said you were just focused my grandson's the same way he's four months old or he's seven months old now but from the time he was three to four months old television come on bright colors he go first thing my daughter-in-law did was call me and said this baby's just like you <laughs> he don't hear nothing he don't see anybody else. He just focused on what he's focused on. My prayer is that God will help me to make sure that focus stays on him 
so it can't be broken and it can't be distracted. How many of you today are ready for God to use you this year in a way he's never used you before? Would you wave your hand if you're ready for that? You want God to use you for his glory this year in a way that he's never used you before. Just stick your hand up. Hold it up for a second. You say, what, don't worry, I'm not coming after you. But what I am saying is this, is if you don't want him to, he's not going to. You don't have to worry about it. He won't. But if you want life to be a, something more than just you, if you want your life to be filled with more than just your world, then invite him to become the center and the heart of your world and watch what he does. So this is what I'm going to do. We're at the end of this service today. I'm going to ask you right now, those of you that have raised your hands and said, I want God to use me this year for his glory in a greater way than I've ever been used in my life. Would you just come and stand with me very quickly? Very quickly. I can always tell how much you want it by how fast you move. Think about it. Could God really use you? I was asking myself that question when I was 13 years old. I remember praying 15 years old. I was mopping the floor. I told the church I wanted to be the janitor. My, my brother was a pastor at the time, and he said, are you out of your mind? He knew what my room looked like. They, turned, they, they, they put me at that old church, and it was a storefront, had linoleum floor, fold-up metal seats. They dropped me off, and I'd get out an old rag mop in a bucket, and I'd start mopping. And I couldn't sing, but the only one that was listening was Jesus, so he didn't care. And I started singing that song, Jesus, use me. Lord, don't refuse me. Surely there's a work I can do. And even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. For though the cost be great, I'll work for you. See, I wasn't, I was never, I was never concerned about somebody knowing my name. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew his name. Lord, just use me. God, let me, let me be able to share someone with you. I remember when it happened to Debbie. I remember Debbie all of a sudden, we're on the evangelistic field. I remember when it happened, we were in a, a town called Cleveland, Mississippi in a Western Sizzling Steakhouse. She looked at me and she said, and I noticed she seemed nervous and I thought, man, what's wrong with her? And she goes, would you go wait for me in the car? I thought, what's the deal? And I went in the car and what, I didn't know what was going on, but God was dealing with her to talk to this waitress. She wasn't the lady you know her as today. She was a little insecure, a little apprehensive. And she said, Lord, if this is really you, then let that woman, let, give me an opportunity here where I can talk to her and nobody's distracting. All of a sudden she walks out and she's all by herself and Debbie's there with her and she steps up and starts to talk to her. And that girl gives her heart to God. That's been several years ago and thousands of souls ago. What are you talking about? Because from that moment, it did something to her. And ever since then, she's had a hunger and a thirst for souls. Unlike anyone I've ever known. And I'm not just saying that because she's my wife. I, she just wants God to use her. Here's the deal. Is, see, sometimes I, I, I put off getting to where I needed to be. You know why that happened? Because I kept focusing on me. I kept reminding God how I couldn't do it. I kept telling him everything that was wrong with me like he didn't know already. I kept trying to tell him the reasons that, that I, I could never. And all of a sudden it dawned on me and God began to quicken my heart. Quit looking at yourself and quit focusing on yourself and focus on me. And when I started focusing on him, my life changed. How many of you in here today 
not only want your life changed, but you want to be able to help other lives change. Hold those hands up right now. Are you ready? This is our pleasure. Everybody take someone by the hand right now. Now hear me. You may be, you may be in the midst of a famine. Things may be going on in your life that you, you, you feel like are out of control and you, you, you can't stop it. Hear me. If you stay focused on him, you've got a promise from him that he's going to get you to the place he's prepared for you. He's saying, I got it already prepared. Let me say it this way. God's getting us ready for what he already has ready for us. Say it with me, would you? God's getting me ready for what he already has ready for me. In other words, God's saying, I've already got it ready. I'm just waiting on you. I, I'm just waiting for you to get ready, to get ready, to get ready. Stretch those hands to heaven me right now. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we ask you, God, to have your way this year. We yield ourselves to you. God, we give ourselves to you. We ask that you'll help us keep our focus on you. God, help me not to focus on what I want, but on what you want. Help me to give myself so that someone else might come to know you. We give you praise for it right now in Jesus' name. Come on, give me a hand clap of praise. If you're in here today, if, if you're in here today and you've got a need, I want you to come up. We want to pray for you. And look, I believe this. I believe, I, I know that God already knows what you need, right? But what did he say? He said, we have not because we ask not. You know, think about it. Think about it this way. Think about your son. If your son had, had, had been on a trip or something and, and all of a sudden he, he finds himself in a place and he's, he's got no money, he's got no food, and he's, he, he doesn't call you because he doesn't want to bother you. How would that make you feel? He said, are you kidding me? You're not a bother to me. I love you. I want to take care of you. I want to help you. For God so loved me. Say it, would you? For God so loved me. Yours, my heart is yours. Take it all, take it all.
focus gets off, it can keep us circling in the wilderness. They turned 11 days into 40 years because they couldn't keep their focus. Hear what I'm going to say and, and make a mental note of it. When my focus becomes more about what I'm going through than about the one that can see me through, I'm going to keep wandering. But the moment, and this isn't easy to accomplish. I'm, what I'm telling you is not an easy thing. But the moment I can get my focus off, it's not, it's not that I'm acting like nothing's happening or nothing's going on. It's a fact that I've shifted focus and I've choose to rest my mind and my heart on God. And there've been a lot of times that I've prayed and I've said, God, I don't know how you're going to do this but I know you're going to do it. He said he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. (laughs) I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you're going to do it. And then you walk toward it. I'm looking at the lady over here that they wrote her off, wanted her to do all sorts of treatments and things, and she said, I'm just going to trust God. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, when the cancer was gone, they didn't have an answer. But she did. She did. As you walk into this new year, you walk in determined with your mind made up, nothing is going to rob me of my focus from God. Nothing is going to take me away from my relationship with God. I promise you, if the devil finds out that there's something that he can do that'll cause you to lose focus, he'll do it to you over and over and over and over again. Because his whole purpose and plan is to keep you from being able to keep your heart and your mind focused on him. Everybody say, not this year. Say, I belong to God. I'm His, and I'm focused on Him. Amen.